So we've been talking about substances, and that substance is a, comp is a uh, composite of matter and form. So that's one part of the answer to the problem or the question of metaphysics is what does it mean to be? What does it mean to exist? Aristotle an Aristotle's answer is to be a substance. So the next part of the uh, question is uh, why? Why do these things exist? Right. Now, uh, Aristotle's answer, uh, in part, is, is also going to answer why things change. So looking out here, we have lots of substances, and they're undergoing a lot of change. Trees are undergoing change, the grass, the bushes, I'm undergoing change. You know, even just the fact that I'm moving around, that's a kind of change. And the question is, what's going to account for that? Aristotle's answer uh, is the four causes. Now, don't think of cause here the way that we think of cause. We think of cause as something very mechanistic, a transfer of energy, uh, you know, dominoes falling over in sequence, one domino knocking over another. Uh, we think of cause as, uh, you know, reactions, action and reaction. It's not exactly what Aristotle has in mind. Um, when Aristotle talks about cause, uh, he, he's, he means something more of what we would, what we would describe as explanation. So the why uh, something exists. So when we, so Aristotle talks about the four causes, he means something like the four whys. Um, you know, before you get on Aristotle's case, that was the original meaning, <laughs> or the, no, the word that we derive, that we now translate as cause, we understand to be cause, originally meant something like explanation, and specifically in a legal context. So we have the four causes for Aristotle, the formal, the material, uh, the efficient, and the final, which basically is, what is it, what's it composed of, what brought it about, and where's it going? The formal and the material cause, uh, you pretty much guess, that's the form and the matter. What kind of thing it is and, and what composes it, what's it made of. So looking at this tree, let's step this way, <laughs> looking at this tree right here, all right, we understand its form. It's a tree, it's a cedar tree, even more specifically. And we look at its matter, what composes it. Uh, bark, wood, sap, water, minerals, sunlight, certain gases, all, right, all these are involved in what composes that tree. So you can understand the efficient cause basically is, you know, what do, where does this thing come from or from what does this thing come from? So looking at these trees around us right now, these trees did not suddenly just sprout from the ground. They, uh, they did not just you know, pop into existence in the middle air, settle down and take root. Right, these trees come from something. You know, these uh, trees you know, most immediately were preceded by a, a seed. Right? But the seed comes from somewhere too. Right? The, namely, the seed comes from other trees. So the idea behind efficient cause is um, that you know, everything comes from something else. Now you might wonder, well, why, why are we doing this? Well, remember, uh, this is an idea that's real prevalent in, amongst the philosophers at the time, thanks to Parmenides. Um, it's impossible that something comes from nothing. Nothing is not causally efficacious. Why? Because it's nothing. <laughs> it is neither a cause nor it's an effect. Uh, so in this mindset, all these things around us, yeah, they come from something. Trees come from other trees, this earth, right? All this ground comes from ground, it comes from somewhere. Sky comes from something. You know, you and I, we come from something. They didn't just pop into existence. It's a neat little trail. It's got some nice views down there. You know, this trail has a purpose. Right? It leads off to a destination. It has a route. It's not just simply a trail to nowhere. Well, even you know, identifying this trail, part of what identifies this trail is where it goes. Uh, what's its location? Uh, why is it made that way? 
that's part of its, its end, its purpose. As part of what helps us understand what this trail is, as it heads off that way and actually loops back around uh, the park. All right, that's, that's an end, that's a purpose. Uh, it's a function of it. These trees, yeah, they have a purpose too. Right? Um, they uh, grow up, not down. <laughs> uh, they grow slightly off to the side, but they don't just stick strictly to the side. Right? Um, there is something of what it means to, to function as a tree, to be that tree. Not just its definition or its essence. I mean, that's part of it. But there's something of what it means to be a healthy, living tree. It has an end. This tree, these trees, uh, they will grow for a time, and then they will die and fall apart. But that's its end. That's its purpose. It's fulfillment of what it is. A tree that, uh, you know, is something that starts to grow, you know, might kind of sort of be a tree. But then it, if it stops, if it, if it dies uh, too soon, it was never fully actualized as a tree. It never reached its purpose, its end. This is kind of the idea of what it means to have a final cause. What's the end? What is the purpose of this thing? Final causes are um, sometimes difficult to sort out. You have to understand what a thing is before you understand what its final cause is, what its purpose is. Uh, some things are easier than others. I mean, especially when we're talking about objects made by people. So this hat, its end, its function, its purpose is really evident, namely to provide shade. Sunglasses, the same thing, to protect the eyes against sunlight. Clothing is really kind of straightforward as to what its end is. When you start getting to natural objects, or you know, objects that are not created by people, well, it gets a little fuzzier sometimes. Sometimes it's harder to tell. Uh, you know, even the sun. Right? What is its end? Well, one of the, one of the things that's going to happen to the sun is it's eventually going to blow up. <laughs> but in the meantime, it does serve a purpose. Right? It has a function in the solar system. It keeps the planets in a certain orbit. It provides energy for this planet uh, for the various forms of life. You know, uh, Aristotle looked down the looked around in the world and he saw this happening all over the place because he. he he looked out into the world and saw purposes, ends, goals. You know, not necessarily, you know, the tree doesn't think to itself, I want to be tall. No, that's not what he's talking about. All right? He's saying that there's uh, something what it means to be a tree. You know, trees don't just start sprouting wings and start flapping away. No, that's, that's not what happens with a tree. A tree functions, has a goal, an end of what it means to be a tree. So this rounds out the four causes. We have the formal and the material, what kind of thing it is, what's it composed of. We have the efficient, where it comes from, and we have the final, where it's going. So I'm not really able to be in the shot here because I kind of have to zoom in on this little guy. But this is um, a cedar tree, right? It's kind of a sproutling. Here, you can see very sharp little needles. Uh, it's still really young. It's not tall at all. You know, if you get perspective, it's a little bit over my ankle. It's still a really young little cedar tree. Now, it, it is a tree, right? It has roots. It, you know, genetically it's a tree. It has the features of a tree. But it's still really early on. Uh, in terms of its end, it has a long way to go. It has many years left for this tree before it fully is what it's supposed to be. So I'll compare that cedar tree we just looked at with this one, right? This one is much further along the way to being a fully realized, a fully actualized tree, right? Uh, its branches are thicker, its trunk is thicker, it's fuller, it's got roots that are deeper down, it's higher. 
it's further along in its process of being a tree. That other one we looked at was just kind of getting started. This is the difference between potentiality and actuality. That tree that we looked at had very had just a little bit of actuality compared to this one. Actuality is the extent to which something has fulfilled its final cause, its purpose, its end, its goal. Uh, potentiality is how much further <laughs> it has to go. Um, now we don't mean by potentiality, um, you know, just the various things that it can do, right? That's the way that we use the term. Now potentiality means uh, how for, uh, for Aristotle, how much further it has to go. How much further it has uh, to be completed, to be the, the thing that it is. You know, it's not as if this tree doesn't have any potentiality, it's just, but it's just further along. It has less potentiality than that younger one that we looked at. Actuality is the extent to which something has fulfilled its final cause, and potentiality is the extent to which it, you know, it has to go, it has yet to go, right? It has much more to do. Aristotle would have loved this place. He loved to watch and observe things. He loved nature. Now, one of the things that he noticed uh, is that things uh, grow for a while. They begin, they grow for a while. They reach their fullest, and then they die, and they degrade. That's kind of what happens with every natural object on the planet, including you and I. So, when we, when, you know, when we're talking about this potentiality and actuality, uh, he has something very real in mind. Right? Once something has reached its potential, once it's, you know, when it has no more potential, right? when it's its completeness, when it's, it's at its end, that's when it starts to cease to be. Right? Once you've, once it's achieved that goal, that purpose, it's done. And um, the idea behind you know being fully actualized, right? Having no more potential means that you, it's done everything that it can do, everything it's supposed to do. Um, so this is one consequence of this idea of potentiality and actuality: is that once the potential is fulfilled, once there's no more potential, it's fully actualized. It can be no more. It can't be anything more than its potential. Aristotle draws some pretty significant conclusions from this idea of potentiality and actuality. So just looking at these trees around us, right, these trees can only do so much. Right? They can process oxygen, they can take up nutrients from the ground, they can uh, use water to live, and, uh, you know, they can make baby trees. <laughs> uh, through their own reproductive processes, they can make baby trees. Now, because of the kind of thing it is, it can only confer so much being. Right? These trees can only make other trees. Because of the kind of thing it is. We wouldn't expect a tree to, you know, drop a seed and that seed sprouts into a dog. Right? That would be weird. <laughs> uh, that's not the, you know, the natural order of things. That's not what we see. Um, you know, similarly, dogs do not give birth to trees. Right? Um, that's not the kind of being that it is. It can't confer that being uh, onto something else. So, the point that Aristotle is making here is that whatever brings about this being can't be less of a being than what ex already exists. Right? So looking at these trees here, what brings about these trees must have at least as much being as these trees. Right? When, we're talk about, when we're talking about dogs, whatever brings about dogs must have at least as much being as a dog. Um, when we're talking about any creature that has to have at least as much being as that creature. Same thing with human beings, right? 
whatever brings about a human being must have at least as much being as a human. So the point that Aristotle is making here is that whatever exists uh, has to have been brought about by something with at least as much existence as that. At least as much. It's really quite gorgeous out here. <laughs> you may not like Aristotle's conclusion here, but what would it mean to reject it? All right. So he has this idea of um, things with limits, right? There's limits on the being. And this is real intuitive. I mean, we talked about this before. One of the things that makes a thing a thing is its limits. You know, just start looking at the categories. That's, those are lots of limits. Quantity, right? Um, some of these trees are 20 feet high. They're not 50 feet high. I'm only about six feet high. I'm not 20 feet high. Um, you know, to have, for a thing to have limits means it has a limit on being. It's only so much being there. So, you know, some, uh, you know, some things have like this much being, right? And then some things have this much being. Okay. Now, if you reject Aristotle's idea that whatever exists has to come from something with at least as much being, then you're saying that, well, that sometimes things with this much being produce things with this much being. Right? Well, now there's a real difference in the you know, kind of amount of being. So just trying to you know, work my hands out here, right? There's about this much difference of being right? that came from, from here. Well, where did this come from? Where did that existence come from? If you say it, it came from here, from this object over here, then you're saying that there's a whole lot of being, namely this much, there's a whole lot of being that came from nothing. right? Because it only has this much being. Where did the rest come from? Where did that rest come from? It didn't come from anywhere. Because there's only so much existence right here. So if you reject Aristotle's idea that uh, things have to come from something with at least as much being, then you're saying there's a lot of existence that comes from nothing. And now we're back in that weird, seemingly impossible scenario where something comes from nothing. A lot of steps along the way. You know, I keep progressing on up to my goal, <laughs> trying to get to the top. Well, we're pretty much all doing that. We're trying to get to that goal, trying to be this fulfillment. Now, we've been talking about this idea of potentiality and actuality, and Aristotle has told us that everything comes from something with at least as much being as a self. These trees come from something that's at least as real as the tree. I come from something at least as real as I am. Now, what does this mean? Well, one way to start thinking about this, you start following the implications, is to say that for everything that exists, there's something at least as great as it. Or there has been <laughs> something at least as great as it. Can we keep going with this? Well, suppose we keep going. For the trees, right? For every tree, there's been something at least as great as the tree. Well then, for that great thing, there's been something at least as great as that thing, and so on and so forth. For people, there's been something at least as great as the person. So we, we keep carrying the implications, and pretty soon, what we have is we start generating an infinite number of things. 
and not only an infinite number of things, but an infinite number of things that have existed. So there's, there's kind of chain. Well, can we continue with that? Is it possible that there's an infinite number of things where we're talking about this infinite regress of being? For every being, there's something at least as great, if not greater, than that thing. Well, Aristotle doesn't think so. And you know, we probably shouldn't either. Because <laughs> if there is this infinite regress of being, then we're saying, first of all, we're saying that an infinite number of things have already existed. That gets a little dicey. But even more to the point, we're saying that we're at the end of an infinite chain of things. Well, that's impossible. You can't be at the end of an infinite chain. That's like, you know, that's like uh, being at the last number. There isn't a last number. So if there isn't an end, excuse me, if there isn't an infinite, then there has to be something that's at least as great as uh, everything else. All right. Well, can we put a limited number on that? All right, let's say greatness, let's say we start measuring units of greatness, and we're pretty great, so we're around a 50, and trees are pretty good too, but they're not as great as us, so they're around a 30. All right. So what number would this greatness be? Well, let's say 10,000. <laughs> we'll just put 10,000. Well, can that thing be the source of, of everything. Can that thing be the great, the greatest thing of, of all the things? Well, it has a limit. It's, it's 10,000 is its limit. Well then, where's, you know, kind of the remaining greatness? Where did it come from? Well, if we keep asking, if we keep pushing on that question, and we're like, well, what is the 10,000 and first greatest thing? Right, well, we're right back in that, in that chain again. Well, that chain doesn't work. So, you know, we can't have the infinite chain. We can't say that there's a finite amount of greatness for this greatest thing. So what do we have? Well, we have that this greatest thing, whatever it is, has limitless being. There is no finitude to it. It has no limits. And ironically enough, it has no more potentiality either. It's limitless. Potentiality means that there's some degree to which it has, it has not achieved its existence. Well, there is no degree that it's its existence. It's fully completed. Can we say, you know, can ask the question, well, where did that come from? Well, no, it's not going to make any sense because it's limitless being. So this is what Aristotle calls the unmoved mover. Now the unmoved mover, since it is this limitless being, right, it's the greatest thing of all. They, nothing can be greater than it. Well, what we strive for when we're on our way to our own actuality is we're striving for this greatness. Now we're limited. We can only get so great. But we're always striving for this greatness. And since we're always striving for this greatness, we're always striving for this completeness of being, what we're doing is climbing to the top. Right? We can only get so far, but that's what we're aiming at. We're aiming for this fullness, this completeness of being. So this unmoved mover, it's unmoved because there's no greater, no, it can't be any greater. Right? It's achieved all, and it's limitless being. But it's a mover because we're striving for it. All things are striving for this greatness of being. Unfortunately, my striving has many more steps to go.